All right, everyone, I think it's the top of the hour. We'll go ahead and get started as people start to join. Uh, welcome everyone to this week's Mountain West ADC Echo. I am going to dive into a review of this new ARV called Duravarine, a new NNRTI. I will review the data and some of the characteristics. We'll talk about the two main clinical trials in treatment-naive individuals that led to the approval, and just a brief snippet about resistance and some new NNRTI resistance mutations we'll need to learn. First, in general, characteristics of this new NNRTI called Doravarine. Also, please note the abbreviation D-O-R. Uh, it will often get confusing with Darunavir, I think, D-R-V. Some of the advantages, it is a once-daily NNRTI with no food requirement, so that's an advantage over Rilpivirine. It does retain activity in the setting of some common NNRTI resistance mutations. There was a study that showed it to retain activity with a 103N, Y181C, G190A, or a combination of 103N and 181C. So like etrovirine, it retains activity with some common NNRTI mutations, but unlike etrovirine, it's once a day. It also probably has fewer drug-drug interactions. I will note that there are some NNRTI mutations that will affect Dravarine. For example, the Y188L, which people who failed nivirapine may have developed, does affect its activity. So like etrovirine, it really will depend on which mutations and how many mutations and worth plugging into databases like Stanford to assess its activity. I will note an advantage, again, is fewer drug-drug interactions than NNRTIs like Rilpivirine. For example, Duravarin seems to be okay with PPIs. However, it is not totally devoid of drug-drug interactions, and strong CYP3A4 inducers will affect it. For example, rifamycins, St. John's wort, some anticonvulsants. So not zero drug-drug interactions, but fewer than Rilpivirine for sure. There was a study showing it was okay with severe renal impairment. And then as I'll show you, there seem to be some advantages over efavirenz, for example, in terms of the side effects, and probably over darunavir as well in terms of toler tolerability, but we'll come back to that. These are the two drugs approved, as we mentioned last week, a combination single tablet regimen of Duravarine, TDF, the older tenofovir, and 3TC or lamivudine. Uh, pronounced, thank you, David, for helping me with the pronunciation and these slides, Del Strigo, and then a Duravarine single tablet called Pefeltro. Let's talk about the two clinical trials that led to the approval. First, a study called Drive Ahead. This is a randomized controlled trial comparing the combination tablet Duravarine TDF3TC to a Favarin's TDF-FTC. So this is a tripla as initial therapy. This is the study design. So this was an RCT in antiretroviral naive adults with no resistance to the study drugs. Chronic hep B or C were allowed. And you can see the regimens here and the overall number of participants in each arm, 364 in each arm. I'll show you the punchline, the week 48 virologic response by FDA snapshot. So this is the percentage with HIV RNA or viral load below 50 copies at 48 weeks. You can see here the overall percentage in the Duravarine arm, about 84%, of Favarin's arm, 80%. This was not statistically different. The conclusion was that Duravarine was non-inferior virologically. Remember that by this FDA snapshot measure, all missing data is counted as failures. So you can see here the individuals who had an RNA above 50 copies at 48 weeks. These were not all virologic failures. Some of them were missing data. So I thought it was interesting to pull out the actual virologic failures because there's a couple notable things here. So in the Duravarine arm, there were 22 virologic failures. In the Efavirenz arm, 14. Uh, that was not statistically different. Interestingly, of those who had virologic failure in the Duravarine arm, seven had NNRTI resistance mutations, and actually five of those seven had M184V as well. And you can see here 12 of the 14 in the Favarin's arm had NNRTI resistance mutations. I highlight that because if we compare this to the trials we've seen recently of integrase inhibitors as initial therapy, especially Bictegravir and Dolutegravir, I think this is a notable difference. So when individuals fail NNRTIs, including Duravarine, this new one, they are at risk of developing resistance to both NNRTIs and NRTIs, which does not seem to happen with dolutegravir or bictegravir. So we'll come back to that at the end when we talk about sort of how this may fit into clinical practice and clinical guidelines. But the conclusion here is that virologically, the Duravarine combination tablet seems to be non-inferior to 
the Efavirenz combination tablet, which is a tripla. Here are the treatment emergent adverse events in the two arms with a couple notable things. You can see here in the Efavirenz or a tripla arm, higher overall drug-related adverse events. And I will especially note higher incidence of rash and abnormal dreams, which we know are risks of Efavirenz. And when we drill down a little more on the uh, neuropsychiatric side effects, which of course we're interested in because we know this is the major limitation of efavirenz, you can see here that the rates of dizziness, sleep disorder or disturbance, altered sensorium, all three of those were lower in the deravirine compared to the efavirenz arm. The incidence of depression, suicide, or self-injury was not statistically different, though overall numbers were small. So I personally think we need more data on the mental health risks of deravirine because, again, we know that is the principal limitation of efavirenz. Um, here are the lipid changes. Notably, this isn't percentage, this is absolute changes. And you can see here that the lipid changes largely favored deravirine. The only one here that was statistically different was LDL. Though again, these are sort of absolute changes over 48 weeks, um, not percentages. So changes are small, but there is some indication here that deravirine, that lipid changes from deravirine are favorable as compared to efavirenz. Turning then to the trial that compared deravirine with two NRTIs to boosted darunavir with two NRTIs, this trial was called Drive Forward. The 48-week data were published in Lancet. The 96-week data were presented at uh, the IAS conference in Amsterdam. I'm going to show the presentation from Amsterdam. So a very similar strategy here in terms of enrolling treatment-naive adults randomizing them in one-to-one -one fashion to either deravirine with two NRTIs or bucidarunavir with two NRTIs. You can see here 383 participants in each arm. These are the baseline characteristics. The main reason I wanted to include this is so you could see that the NRTI backbone in both arms was primarily TDF FTC. And here is the outcome at 48 weeks, at which time deravirine appeared non-inferior virologically to bucidarunavir. Interestingly, at 96 weeks, deravirine actually was statistically superior in terms of virologic response. Mm -hmm. However, importantly, this was driven largely by tolerability and treatment discontinuations, not virologic failures. Uh, the virologic failure rate was 9 versus 11 percent, which was not different. You also can see here the number of uh, resistance mutations that happened. And I'm not showing you the lipid changes, but they did favor deravirine over the darunavir. So it does appear that deravirine is favorable in terms of cholesterol changes over darunavir as well. So then a quick highlight of two other abstracts from IAS that I thought were interesting. So what happens if somebody fails deravirine? And I, I note this because they are mutations that we don't usually talk about. So for those of you interested in HIV resistance mutations, this review of deravirine treated persons in the RCTs identified approximately 1% who developed virologic failure and resistance. And the most common mutations were these two, V106I and this one that I had never really thought about before, F227C. But the interesting thing here is if someone develops this F227C, it seems like the virus becomes hyper susceptible to NRTIs, including this new NRTTI, that's not a typo, I'll see if I can remember what that stands for in a second, called MK8591, a extremely long acting agent that's being studied for both HIV treatment and PrEP. And so there is going to be a trial of deravirine and MK8591 as dual therapy. NRTTI stands for Nucleoside Reverse Transcriptase Translocation Inhibitor. It's basically an NRTI that has a slightly different mechanism and function than our current NRTIs, and it is extremely long-acting. So there's some interesting potential here for combinations of deravirine with these novel drugs. One, the other interesting point is it seems that if somebody fails a favarins, deravirine retains activity. If someone re fails ropivirine, deravirine is likely to retain activity, though not always. So again, even if somebody has failed standard or sort of previous first line NNRTIs, deravirine may retain activity. So I think that's an important point. So finally, just to wrap up here, deravirine does appear to offer some advantages over existing NNRTIs, as I outlined. In the clinical trials, it was non-inferior virologically to a favarins with a better side effect profile. 
uh, notably fewer CNS side effects, fewer cases of rash, and probably better for lipids. It was superior to boosted darunavir really based on tolerability and side effects. So then the question I think that comes out is, well, how is this going to fit into guidelines? Our DHHS and IASUSA guidelines really emphasize that we should, we should be starting integrase inhibitors and we should be starting TAF. This combination tablet is neither of those. So I'm going to be really curious to see how the guidelines committees handle this Duraverine TDF 3TC combination pill and where that fits into our options and armamentarium. Personally, as an aside, I'm a little more interested in Duraverine as a single tablet for part of salvage regimens or dual therapy. To me, I can really see a role there given the advantages over Ropivirine for the folks who can't stop their PPI, um, have trouble taking it with a full meal, have some other reason they can't take Ropivirine or struggle with the BID dosing of etrovirine. For me, I'm very intrigued by the potential of Duraverine single tablet I have a big question mark in my mind about the role of Duraverine TDF3TC as a combination tablet, especially for initial therapy, especially if there's no real cost benefit over other regimens. I have no idea yet about the cost, so we'll have to stay tuned for more about that. There is a switch study ongoing called Drive Shift, which is shifting from other regimens to the combination tablet. And I think we need more data on the mental health side effects of Duraverine, certainly on pregnancy risk, and then interactions with meds like Hep C, uh, DAAs. I did see some data that Draverin appears to be okay with sofosbuvir ledipasvir. I haven't seen a lot of data for combinations with other regimens though. So that was a whirlwind through the data for Draverin, the new pill. Here are some references that I didn't have room to fit in earlier. If you're interested in more in the resistance, food and drug interactions, activity with severe renal impairment, which did seem to be fine, or those initial drive forward results. But with that, I'll stop. We'll take a couple minutes for questions or comments, and then we'll move on to cases.